need you to go back, probably around first grade, maybe, maybe kindergarten for some of you. We would get those worksheets, and it was simply the title on the top of the worksheet was, What Comes First? Then it would have a picture of Sally maybe getting on the school bus. Then next to that would be a picture of Sally getting out of bed. Then you'd have to take out your crayon. I preferred blue because it was my favorite color. And you had to circle which one came first. And so you'd circle the right one, and you'd hand it into the teacher, and you'd get the big smiley face back. Well, I want to give you an updated version of what comes first. I'm going to give you two things, then you need to decide which comes first. We're going to start with an easy one, though. The building or the foundation, which comes first? Foundation. Wonderful. You've got it. First, the foundation is laid, then you build the building on top of that. Okay, make it a little bit harder. Texting or emojis? Which came first? Texting came first, then emojis were added later. For those of you that text, I know you want to know this, so this is for you. In 2016, at the end of the year, Apple came out with the most used emoji. The winner was the red heart, most used emoji in texting. So that came first, it was texting, then emojis were added onto it to make texting a better experience. Here we go. What came first? Binge watching or Netflix? Whoa, 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 whoa. I got a, if you're watching online, I got a resounding binge watching. The answer is actually Netflix. Netflix came first. The concept of binge watching was around. Don't get me wrong, you could sit down and watch lots of shows. But I think it was in 2003, Netflix did the research to find out what binge-watching really is, and they coined the term binge-watching. If you watch more than four episodes of something in one sitting, you have officially crossed the line from casual viewership to binge-watching. Now you know. More useless information that you will probably never remember, but there you go. You have it anyway. What about this one? What comes first? Being loved or loving other people? Because this is a fundamental need that we all have. We all want to experience love, and there's something inside of every single one of us that says, ah, I should love these other people. Let's take it even a step further than that. What about God? What comes first? Loving God or being loved by God? Because one of them does come first. And that's a question we're going to be looking at tonight. But before we jump into it, I want to welcome you back to our series entitled, Does God Affect Me? We've been going through the book of Ephesians. During this time, we've had a great experience looking to see how God affects us every single day if we will let him. And we've gone through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. We are on chapter 5 this week. And I believe what we find in chapter 5 unlocks what it means to be a follower of Jesus and how he can affect you in an extremely profound way. If you've missed any of the series up to this point, feel free to go online, roswellgrace.com, click on the watch tab, click on this series, and you can get caught up to speed on all of the book of Ephesians that we've gone through up to this point and this series. If we haven't met yet, my name is Josh Gallagher. It's a privilege to have you here this evening. I like being straight up honest with everyone that comes here. I have one goal for you tonight. Here it is. I want you to know that you're loved. By God, by me, by the experience you have here. If you walk away saying, that was horrible music, that was the worst teacher I have ever heard, and I didn't like the cookies, but you say, I know that I was loved, we've been successful, and we'll try to up the cookies. We can't do much about the teacher, all right? That's kind of the way it is. But that's my goal. We want you to know that you're loved tonight. That's it. So thank you for joining us. We're going to have a great time together this evening as we look at God's word and how it can affect 
us every single day. Well, as we get ready to answer this question, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2 are going to be the main verses that we're looking at tonight. So if you have a Bible, feel free to open to that. But before we even jump in, we've got to stop. The passage that we're going to be looking at comes from one letter. It was the letter to the church in Ephesus that Paul wrote. He couldn't be there physically because he was under house arrest in Rome. But he loved these people so much, he's like, I want to write them a letter. So he writes them this letter so he could still love them and encourage them. So he sends this letter. What we do, what I do, what most pastors do, what do we do? We look at this letter or any letters or books of the Bible and we kind of rip it apart. And it's amazing. We can take one letter and we can extend it out for a whole year of sermons if we really want to. But as we're looking at the different concepts in this one letter, it's easy to get it separated. To say, okay, well, this is this chunk, and then we think, okay, well, Paul must wrote another letter. This is this chunk, and this is this chunk. But it's one continuous letter. Think of it like this. Do you remember in fourth grade? We'll say fourth grade. It was fourth grade for me, so maybe it was fourth grade for you. You received that first love note. Yeah? Yeah? You remember that first love note? Or maybe I should say love email? I did receive a love email when I was in fourth grade because email was just coming out. Side point, anyway, I'm moving on. Here you go. Once you received that, or maybe it was a private Facebook message, once you received that, did you just look at the first line and be like, oh, okay, I guess they kind of like me. No, are you kidding me? You print that thing off if you need to. You show it to all your friends. You're like, they love me. They love me. And you scour that letter. You read it before you go to bed. You wake up in the morning. You read it again. You have that letter with you everywhere you go. And you look at the whole letter and say, this is what this person feels for me. And at the end, when they say, meet me on the playground during recess, when you went down the slide with that person, it was love at first slide. That's right. That's right. That's right. Anyway, I'm moving on. But you took the letter and you looked at the whole thing. You didn't just rip it apart and be like, oh, good, she knows my name. Moving on. Oh, good, she wants me to meet me at the slide during recess. Good. No, you look at the whole thing. Well, what we do is sometimes we look at these letters and we just pull out certain parts of it instead of stopping to look at the whole thing. What we're going to be talking about tonight is crucial. We've got to look at the whole context of the letter, not just a couple verses. And so here's where Paul has brought them up to this point in the book of Ephesians. And started in chapter 1, verse 1 through 416. He simply says, you're loved. And he tells this to the church in Ephesus a lot of different ways. The first thing he tells them is, hey, God chose you before the beginning of the world. He sent Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You are now completely righteous and holy before God. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He's going to pour out his riches on you now and into the future. And he loves you. But he doesn't just talk about God. He also says, I love you. Paul prays two extremely powerful prayers over this church in Ephesus. And he says, hey, I want God to do this. I hope to see this. You should be unified. And he's saying, I love you. So the first thing he wants them to know is, hey, you're loved by God and by me, Paul is saying. But Ephesians doesn't stop at chapter 4, verse 16. It goes on. Starting in verse 17 through basically the end of the book, he says, okay, now it's time to love God and other people. Unfortunately, this is what we do. We break sermons and messages and our concept usually of following Jesus into one or or two of these two categories. And here's what it looks like. We'll look at this first one and say, okay, we just need to be loved by God. You've maybe heard sermons, you're righteous, you're holy, God loves you exactly as you are. If you just accept Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you can be made completely brand new. You're loved. Please hear me. Yes, that is true. There is nothing wrong with that. That's the truth of God that he wants to convey to you, that you're loved exactly as you are. You don't have to change anything. You can come to him right now where where you're at, what, what you have done and what you will do, because you are loved The problem is, though, if we focus just on being loved, we get stunted in our growth. Because the concept of being loved is, I just need to sit back and just let God love me. Which is true, don't get me wrong, but if you stop there, it's like, I don't need to do anything else. I'm just like I'm supposed to be, and I'm fine. I have met people like this. When they fall into this, they stop growing. 
because they think the center of God's plan is me. It all ends with me. Moses, Moses brought the Old Testament law for me. Jesus came and died just for me. And by the way, all of the rest of eternity, it better be somewhat about me. Because I just need to be loved. During this time, we like to focus on verses like John 3.16. Again, great verse, biblical truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. Truth, yes, you are loved. But that's not all that there is. Just like in Paul's letter, he says, now it's time to turn around and love other people. The problem is if we fall in just, okay, now we need to love other people and love God, we fall into this trap. We think, okay, I've got to work, I've got to work, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. The pastor said don't do that, but he did say do this, so I better get busy. I've got to go, 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 go. I'm at church six days a week, and the other day during the week I'm out serving in the community. i just got to work, 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 work. The problem is, if you fall into just this concept, you easily start thinking that you need to earn God's love. And it's all about how much can I do for God because I maybe need to pay him back. But, as you see, this is one letter. It's not either or. He starts off by saying, you're loved. And at the exact same time, once you understand that, what's next? You need to love. And there's two verses that unlock this whole concept for us. And it's these two verses that we're going to look at tonight. Here's the first one. Ephesians 5, verse 1. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Great word here, follow. He's basically saying, you need to be imitators of God. This is where, you remember, he's crossing the line saying, okay, now it's time for you to start loving other people and loving God. But what was the basis for it? Look at this. Therefore, as dearly loved. This is an adjective. He's describing who they are. He says, don't forget. I spent the whole first half of this letter, the first basically four chapters, reminding you you're loved. Don't forget that. But does he stop just at verse 1? Nope. Guess what comes next? Verse 2. Wow, you guys are good. Yes, verse 2 comes next. Look at what he says. I love this word. And... He doesn't say either or, well, if you're not going to do that, you should do this. No. And. In addition to being loved, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He says you need to understand that you're loved, but it doesn't stop there. And you need to walk. This is referring to a lifestyle. He's saying, your life needs to reflect what? Love for other people and love for God. Well, what does this look like? Because we can interpret this a whole lot of different ways. He's like, let me just tell you what it looks like in case you're wondering. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So if you want to know, okay, what does this love look like? Looks like what Jesus did for you. That's what it looks like. So here's what he's saying, very simply. Be loved. Understand that you are loved by God. He is crazy about you. And love. You need to love other people. And you need to love him. A lot of times we get this confused. We think it's one or the other. Have you ever gone out to eat with that person that says, you ask them, hey, where should we go eat? And they say, I don't care. Then you go start driving in a certain direction towards a restaurant, and they say, where are we going? And you say, oh, well, we're going to this restaurant. And they're like, oh, I don't want to eat there. Some of you know that person. And you're like, okay, well, where do you want to go? What do they say? Oh, I don't care. Wherever you want to go, it doesn't matter. So you start driving to a new restaurant. You start going, they say, oh, well, where are we going now? Oh, we're going to this restaurant. Oh, I don't want to go there. Uh-uh. It's like... <laughs> Pull, the, pull over, you say, okay, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Then at that point, you just go to the nearest fast food joint. You get them a Happy Meal or whatever kid's meal it is, and you say, here, eat that. That's it. All right, that's what you do, okay? Here's what we do, though. We'll set off and we'll tell people, hey, this is what it means to follow Jesus. We'll say, all you need to do is just be loved. Just accept his free gift, which is true. 
But then we turn around and say, okay, but you better start loving other people and loving God. And it sounds like we're sending two completely different messages. Because it's like, wait, I'm just supposed to receive this and not do anything for it. But then in the next week I come back, you're saying, okay, now you better get to work and you better start doing all these things differently. Which one is it? It's both. We experience that we are loved by God and then he wants us to turn around and love other people. But this concept, this isn't the only time it's mentioned. It's all throughout the Bible. Another place that it's mentioned, 1 John 4.10. He talks about love again and this is what he says. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, hold on. I'm gonna geek out for a second here on the original language, bear with me. He's saying, not that we've loved. This is in the perfect tense. What this means is, you haven't done this perfectly. In case you're wondering, you're not going to love God perfectly. Not gonna happen, sorry. He's saying, we haven't done this perfectly. So what is love? It's that God loved us. And what does he do? Again, he gives us an example and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Are you catching this? Every time that we hear about God's love, he's attaching it, or John and Paul, they're attaching it to what Jesus did, saying there is an action that goes with love. This isn't just to sit back, have a good feeling about it, and say, oh, this is love. No. Being loved means I'm actually going to do something about it. So he's saying you haven't done this perfectly. It doesn't start with you. It started with God. Then he goes on in 1 John 4, 19. Look at this. Puts it very simply. We love because he first loved us. We love God and other people because what came first? His love for us. That is where it all starts. So again, even John is saying, be loved and love. So if we understand that this is the foundation that we're supposed to be loved, I want to read for you very briefly parts of chapter 5, verses 3 through 11. Now remember, we have our foundation. He spent the whole first half of the letter saying, okay, you're loved by God, but now it's time to love other people. Now with that in mind, listen to this. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by, this who, by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in these things that people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. That's just through verse 10. He goes on. He's going to remind them more things of what they should and shouldn't be doing. Here's just a quick review. I'm not going to read it all. But the first thing he says, again, these are things you shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be sexually immoral. You shouldn't be impure. You shouldn't have greed. You shouldn't have obscene stories. There shouldn't be foolish talk. Nor, no coarse joking. Or you shouldn't make excuse for your sins. He goes on. Don't get drunk. Don't sleep around. Why? Now it's easy for sometimes as us as pastors to get up and say, okay, don't do these things. Boom, 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 boom. And you ask why? Well, God said so. Yes, but it's deeper than that. Because the foundation is we're loved by God. And once we fully understand his love, we naturally should want to love him and other people. And so in our quest to love him and other people with the foundation of his love, these are the things that we don't do. Because it's not loving to God and other people. But he goes on and he also says in chapter 5 some things that we should do. Here's a short list. He says, live in the light of the Lord. Be thankful. Do things that are good, things that are right, things that are true. Live wisely, be filled with the Spirit, give thanks, submit to one another. Now this is a really controversial one, here you go. Wives, submit to your husbands, that's in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as he loves the church. 
we look at these verses and it's like, oh, it's just more do's and don'ts and do's. No. You're missing the foundation of everything that he's talked about in the first four chapters, which is you're loved. And because you are loved, you need to turn around and love other people. But even if you don't, even if you do sleep around, even if you do have coarse choking, even if you, do, if you are sexually moral, if you do all these things, if you're full of greed, please hear me. You're still loved. God's, a, God's smart. I don't need to tell you guys that. You know that. But look at how this works when we put this all together. God said, okay, I'm in charge. I am going to take the first step. I'm going to show you my love. Before the world even began, he chose us. He knew we were going to screw up, but he says, I am going to send my son to pay the penalty for the things that you have done wrong. Not just so you can have those things wiped away, but you can enjoy eternity forever with me. And when you're here, I'm going to pour out my blessings on you forever and ever. And we're going to have a close, intimate relationship. God takes the first initiative. He says, you're loved. But remember, and he wants us to do something else. What is that? Love other people and love him. Now for the people that actually take this to heart and they understand that, okay, I'm loved by God and now it's time for me to start loving other people. When they take the step to love other people, what happens? That person feels loved. Whoa! Whoa! Once they feel loved and they understand, whoa, I'm really loved by God and other people. I want to help others. And I want to love God and I want to love other people. So what do they do? They turn around and love someone else. When they love that other person, that person feels loved. And it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. To us that are sitting here tonight. You're loved. And God set this whole thing up and he initiated all of it saying, it's starting with me and I'm gonna show you my love. But then once you understand that, I want you to go out and start loving other people. So everything tonight that we're talking about really comes down to these two questions. And it's these two questions I really want you to think about. Here's the first one. Do you know that you are loved by God? Be careful. Don't answer this too quickly. Do you know that you are loved by God? Because if you're looking at this question saying, Josh, I really don't know. This is the most, this is the most important question you can think about for the whole rest of this next week. Because this is the foundation of everything that comes first. If you don't get this right, nothing else matters. You're like, I'm not sure. Let me tell you very briefly. God's crazy about you. He is absolutely in love with you. He knew who you were before you were even born. He knew everything that you would ever do, and he still chose to love you. And it wasn't just a feeling. He sent his son Jesus to come down to take on flesh, to be the payment for all the things that you have done wrong, because those things separate you from an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God. And he didn't want eternity without you. So he sent him down to be the payment for the things that you've done wrong. And all you have to do is receive that. And if you receive that, all of those things that you have done and will do are completely wiped away. And you have a relationship that is perfect with God from now until eternity, no matter what you do. Because the penalty for what you have done and will do has already been paid by Jesus. That's his love for you. What do you have to do? Accept it. That's it. And a simple way that you can even do that right now. Simply acknowledge saying, God, I need your forgiveness. And I believe that that's through Jesus Christ. When you accept that, let his love fill you and change your world. Because it will. But if you're looking at that first question, you're like, Josh, I know that. I know that I'm loved. Then here's the second question. Are you ready to love God and others? Like, really ready to love God and others because 
If you can't say yes to this one, you probably don't have an accurate answer to this one. Because when you compare God's love to what he is maybe asking you to do for him or other people, it is small in comparison. Are you ready to love God and others? Yeah, I mean the people that don't exactly look like you and the people that have talked bad about you and the people that have stabbed you in the back and the people that gossip about you. Yeah, those people. Because that's what God did for us. Once upon a time, there was a man. (laughs) He was broke. Like, dead broke. Not just like no money. He had like $500,000 in debt. And there was no way he could pay it. He didn't have a job. All he had was the clothes on his back. And every single day, he would just sit on the street corner because it's all he knew how to do. He'd made horrible decisions up to that point in his life. He turned his back on everyone that he knew, and he was broke. One day as he's sitting there, a man came, comes up to him. He sits down on the street right next to him. He says, can I talk to you? The poor man says, yeah. He looks him in the eye and he says, I've known you ever since you were little. He says, I know everything that you have ever done. I know the bad decisions you've made. I know some of the good decisions you try to make, but you never did. I know that you're $500,000 in debt. But he says, I have something for you. He pulls out one briefcase and he says, inside this briefcase is $500,000 and it will pay your debt of what you owe. Then he pulls out another briefcase and he says, but this one is $500 million to secure your present life and to move forward. And the poor man just sits there. He's completely stunned. He says, what are you doing? He says, This is all you need to understand. I love you. He said, well, the poor man asked, do I got to sign a contract? Do I got to do something for you? What do you want out of me? I mean, nothing's free. And he says, this is all you need to do is take it. Poor man was like, okay. He takes the money, goes straight to the bank. He wants to know if it's real. It's real. His debts are paid off. He has $500 million that secure his present life and his future. He can't believe it's actually happened. He's been given brand new life. A year into this new life, he receives a phone call from the man who gave him the money. And he said, the man on the phone tells him, he said, I was wondering if you could do me a favor. Could you give me a million dollars? And on top of that, I've got this charity. I want you to donate $5 million to that charity. He says, I want to make this very clear. You don't have to do any of this, but it's a simple request. The man that was once poor but was now rich had a long pause on the phone. He thought. Because on one side he was thinking, wow, that's $6 million. I have a lot of things I could do with $6 million. And he started giving himself some excuses about what he could do with that money and why he shouldn't give it away. But then on the other side, he was thinking, wait, this was the guy that gave me all of this. So there was a long pause. How did he answer? I don't know. Only you know. Because you're the man in that story. God came down when we were in our brokenness. He said, I love you. I want to pay your debt and secure your future. You don't have to do anything. All you need to do is accept it. And when we accept that gift, it changes everything. But then after that, he does tap us on the shoulder every once in a while saying, hey, I want you to love me. And those people over there, I want you to go love them too. And even if we don't, we're still loved by him. But he understands when we start loving him and other people, our relationship with him grows and we find out what life is all about. So it's even for our good. So how would you respond? What would you do? 
If you don't understand how much God loves you, it's going to be very hard to turn around to love him and other people. Here at Grace Sunday Nights, we love to talk, but more importantly, we love to live. We don't want to just talk about these things. We want to live them. And to help you understand the ways that you can live this out, I'm going to give you a couple opportunities to do that. The first one is this. It's a connection card. It's found in the seat in front of you. It's very simple. You can put in your name, address. If you have a prayer request, you can flip it over and put it on the back. This is one example of how, personally for me, I want to show you that you are loved. We've probably never even met. Every time that someone fills out one of these connection cards, you don't have to put your address or phone number. You don't have to fill out anything except your name. You fill out your name, I take those cards and I pray through them throughout the week. Why? Because I have nothing better to do. (laughs) No. Because I want you to know that you're loved. By God and by me. If you have something specific that I can pray for, go ahead, put it on the back, and I'll pray for it. If not, if you just like, Pastor man, I don't know who you are, but sure, I'll take some prayer. My name is Joe. You can make up a fake name, but I'm going to pray for Joe this next week, and that God would show you how much he loves you. That's one way that I want you to know that you're loved by God and by me. But for others of you, you know, okay, I know that I'm loved. I need to start loving other people and loving God better. Here's what you can do. You can sign up for the consistent connection. All you need to do is text in the 3131 in the number line, then the message line, write effect three or effect six. If you type in effect three, you're gonna get text messages three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you do effect six, you're gonna get them Monday through Saturday. Here's what this is. It's a simple text message, and in this text message, we're gonna go through the rest of Ephesians 5. We're gonna take a section each day, and you're gonna be able to read it. There's some questions to think about. Then application points of how you can apply all of these things to your life. Finally, there's some questions that you can discuss with other people around the topic that we are looking at. And in Ephesians 5, it's all about, hey, this is how you can love God and love others. Because we've gone through the basis up to this point that you are loved. But now it's time for you to start loving others. So that's one way that you can dive in this next week to start figuring out how you can better love God and love others. We're not done yet. There's something else you can do. If you've come to Grace Sunday nights for a while, and you're like, okay, I get the love thing. Because when I do come here, I feel the love. I feel the love. I'm going to encourage you maybe, just maybe, it's time to cross the line. Instead of just receiving the love, it's time to give the love away. And here's one way that you can do that. On your chairs, there's this thing called the GSN Impact. It's some top ministry opportunities that you can get involved with here at Grace Sunday Nights. You can take a look at those. And tonight when you leave out in the lobby, we've set up some tables with some different areas that you can serve here at Grace Sunday Nights. The whole reason we're doing this is because we want to give you an opportunity to love others. Because the basis of everything that we do here at Grace Sunday Nights is this concept of what we just talked about. We want you to know that you're loved exactly as you are. That's our goal. Then after you experience that love, you are willing to turn around and love other people and love God. That's it. That's why we're here. So if that's something you're interested in, we'd love to have you get involved of sharing the love of what's going on here tonight. And every single opportunity that's on that card and you're going to see out in the lobby has one common theme. This is a way you can love. Because it doesn't matter if you're in the booth, if you're up here on the stage, if you're setting up these curtains. It's an act of love to let people know whoever they are when they come through those doors that they are loved by us and by God. That's the goal. The final thing that's in your chair, it's called the spiritual health assessment. I would encourage you, when we're done, if you want to fill it out, you can drop it in the box as you're getting ready to leave along with those connection cards. But we put this on your chair tonight because this is a great checkup, we could say, on how am I really doing at loving God and other people. If you're still struggling with God's love for you, don't even worry about that thing. You just need to focus on God's love for you. But if you're like, I know that, but I need to start loving God and other people, I need to cross that line, this is a great opportunity for you to say, Where am I, how am I doing in this area? You can fill that out and then drop it in the box as you leave.
So I had this really cool closing. And I'm going to skip it because I feel like I need to say something else. Guys, you're loved. You are loved. And if you doubt that, you're going to have a really hard time loving God and loving other people. So if you walk away with one thing tonight, I want you to know that you're loved. By us and by God. Let's pray. God, your love started all of this. Not just Grace Sunday Nights, but started the world. The forgiveness of sins that we can experience. That was all because of you. But now, you call us to love you and love others. Because you've already shown us exactly what that looks like. God, for those of us here that maybe don't understand your love, I pray that this next week, you would do something miraculous that we can't even explain other than it's your love for us. Blow our minds away with how crazy you are about us. For others of us, we know that you love us. God, it's time for us to cross the line and start loving you and other people in a very real way. Provide us those opportunities this week as well. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.